a three-year-old girl was kidnapped just 15 feet from her backyard. And 40 years later, her family and police are still looking for her killer. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Rachel Runyon. Viewer discretion is advised. <laughs> Rachel Marie Runyon was born on June 23rd, 1979, and she was born in Ogden, Utah. Rachel was the middle child of three. She had an older brother named Justin and then a younger brother named Nathan. The three of them were like just separated by four or five years or so. So they were very close, you know, they grew up together and they absolutely loved playing together. Her parents, Jeff and Elaine Runyon, uh, they had actually lived in Tennessee prior to Rachel being born. Um, roughly a year or so before Rachel was born, they moved from Tennessee to, I guess, the little town of Sunset, Utah. The Runyons wanted to uh, continue growing their family, because at that point before they moved, they had the one son but they wanted more, and they wanted to make sure they were living in a community that they felt was safe. So they did the research, and they kind of found this little town with about 6,000 people, uh, Sunset. And, you know, they heard so many great things about it. It was such a safe community, great for kids, great for families. And so they ended up moving there. And then a year later, uh, Rachel was born. By the time Rachel was about three years old, she was a child beauty pageant queen. She was actually named Little Miss Sunset about six months or so before this story takes place. Rachel didn't have much time to live, uh, so there really isn't much known about her because she barely got to experience life. The little time that she was on this earth, Rachel was described as a very sweet, very loving girl who seemed to always have a smile on her face, and she loved to laugh. Her parents and grandparents would say that Rachel was just a super well-behaved kid. She got along with everyone, and just everyone adored her. And she, for a child, was very, very trusting. It was August 26th, 1982. It was a sunny, peaceful, Thursday afternoon in the middle of the summer. Elaine was home with the three kids. Uh, her husband was at work. Five-year-old Justin and three-year-old Rachel, they had been begging their mom uh, if they could take Nathan to the playground and play. Now, pretty much all of the time, every single time, Elaine was someone who never let her children go to the playground unsupervised without an adult. Now, something to be said here is that the playground we're talking about is literally 15 feet behind their backyard. Uh, I'm gonna show a photo of the house and the playground as it is today. It looked different back then, which you'll see another photo of that later, but you can see how close we're talking here. The backyard gate back then had a an, like a, a swing open gate, so that would be basically be super easy for you know the family to just kind of go out the backyard gate straight to the playground so the kids can play. The way it's also laid out is that from their kitchen window, you can see a good portion of the playground as it was back then. You cannot see all of it, uh, but you could see enough of it. And if someone needed to shout like, you know, hey kids, what are you doing? You know, like the mom or the dad, it's literally so close. You could have like a loud conversation, so to speak, to make sure they're doing okay. And you can hear them playing. So this one particular time, Elaine said, because they were begging, they were like really, really kind of begging her, like, please, 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 please. 
can we take our brother? He was one years old. Uh, can we please take him to the playground and play with him? And so Elaine caved in and said yes. So for her, the, she was going to be doing some cleaning in the kitchen that afternoon. And she was also making lunch for all of them. So she'd be in the kitchen with the window and be able to see them in the playground. I mean, if you add the length of the backyard, we're talking what? 30-ish feet, maybe, 30, 35 feet from her window to the, to the playground. I know a lot of people nowadays, when I make videos with similar stories, they, they want to sit here and say, well, why'd the parent do this and why'd the parent do that? This is 1982 when this story takes place. All right, 1982, times were, and I say this all the time, times were significantly different. Back then, people were way more trusting uh, of their neighbors, of their community. It just was the time. You know, you couldn't relay a piece of information to the entire world in a second by tweeting something, so, the stories of kids who go missing nowadays, it's its different than it was back then. I just, that's just what I'm going to say. So, Elaine said yes. And the playground was also a part of, like, this elementary school that was also, like, right next to their house, obviously. And there were what appeared to be other, you know, younger kids playing there at the time. The kids basically left the house sometime around, like, 1230 in the afternoon. And over the next, who know, like 15 minutes or so, Elaine is, you know, she can see them. She's kind of, she doesn't have her eyes on them the entire time because she's doing other things, but she constantly is looking up. She's kind of shouting to them, hey, are you guys doing okay? They're responding. Everything's fine. So, you know, everything is going fine. But then at about 12.55 p.m., she looks out the window and she notices that she can't see any of her kids. So she immediately calls out for them, hey, what's going on? You guys need to come home right now. And so within like a minute, Justin, the oldest brother, who's five, he comes home holding the one-year-old brother, Nathan. But Rachel isn't with him. And the mom says, where's Rachel? And so he tells her what had just happened. You know, he came back super upset. At some point, when the kids were playing on the playground, an unknown man parked his car near the playground, got out of his car, and walked towards the playground. The kids did not know who this man was. And at the same time, by the way, there is a 10-year-old boy, who I guess the kids kind of knew, who was also playing there. The man approaches the 10-year-old boy first. Apparently nothing happens from that. The man then goes to the sandbox where Rachel is playing with her two brothers. The man sits down and starts to have like the super quiet but friendly conversation with them. He asks them, what's your favorite ice cream? Do you guys like candy? And so they're, you know, they're kids, you know, five years old, three years old. And then, you know, they have a one year old. Uh, they're like, yeah, you know, we like, you know, this kind of ice cream and blah, blah, blah. And then the guy gets up and says, well, hey, let me take you to the supermarket just down the road because they serve ice cream there, like, you know, scooped ice cream and candy. And I'll, I'll go, I'll buy you guys some if you guys want to come with me. And he looked at Rachel and said, do you like bubble gum? And she said, yes. And, you know, he goes, oh, I have bubble gum in the car. Let's go, let's go get some. And so Rachel, being a three-year-old child, you know, she doesn't know any better. She's trusting. She starts to walk with this guy. And then her older brother Justin's like, Rachel, what are you doing? This is a stranger. We're not supposed to go with strangers. And so Rachel kind of stops and she kind of goes, oh, yeah. And then she turns around and starts to walk back towards her brother. And then this man literally just runs up to Rachel, takes her, throws her over his shoulder and runs away. Rachel starts screaming and then he just sort of forces her into his car and he gets in and he speeds off. And then literally like a moment later is when the mom says, you know, where are you guys? So now Elaine's like, hold, oh my God, like she's freaking out. And her first thought is she loads all the kids into the car and she drives to the supermarket, you know, just thinking, okay, maybe he took her there. Maybe he did. Uh, and so she looks around the entire place, can't find her. She's asking everyone, have you seen Rachel? No one's seen her. She never came in. Holy shit, Rachel is missing. Uh, she immediately calls police, reports her missing. Within an hour of the moment Rachel disappeared, police have roadblocks literally all over town 
just in case this guy hasn't gotten very far. Unfortunately, the Roblox don't do anything because through this method, they'd never find her. Um, they never find the man. They never find the vehicle. They do put a bolo out for this man and for his car. That day, there were no adults at the playground. So police had to rely solely on the eyewitness account of children of a five-year-old boy, a one-year-old who can't say anything about this, and then the 10-year-old boy who was also there. But through them, they're able to get a description of the man, pretty detailed description, and a pretty detailed description of his car. The 10-year-old boy said that the man was a black male who was maybe in his 20s, possibly 30s. He said he was maybe like 5'8", 6 foot tall, possibly. He had like a medium build. He had like this short kind of like Afro style hair is how he described it. At first he described his uh, mustache as like a handlebar mustache. And then later it was sort of kind of determined to be this mustache that had like a split down the middle. So that that aspect changed. The man wore blue jeans. He also had a blue pullover shirt. And there was this like kind of thick red stripe that went across the chest of the shirt and then the sleeves. Uh, I'm showing a picture. Uh, this is an image of a very similar shirt, if not the exact type of shirt. He also had on blue sneakers with uh, white stripes on them. The car was described as looking kind of older, maybe a station wagon sort of car. Again, keep in mind this is a 10-year-old and a 5-year-old describing it. They said the car was like a dark blue color. It had the wood uh, trim around the side of the car. And I'm showing images of a very similar vehicle. It's obviously not the exact one, but this is the car that police believe it likely was. Police said it sounded very similar to a Ford Pinto Squire, which was a station wagon. When the story broke, about Rachel's kidnapping. Uh, police were told that on the same exact day at another park before Rachel was taken, multiple witnesses said they saw a man who looked very similar to the description the boys gave about who took Rachel. They saw this man at a park uh, talking to some very, very young boys, children, uh, at this park. Now, this man didn't actually do anything in terms of obviously taking anyone. The witnesses here described the man as being very similar to what the boys described, but with one major difference, that it wasn't a black male, it was a Hispanic male. Now, the interesting thing about that is the five-year-old, Justin, you know, Rachel's older brother, he said, as best as he could um, as a five-year-old, that he didn't think the man was a black man. He said he looked more like a Hispanic man. The eyewitness of this 10-year-old boy um, who saw the actual kidnapping along with Justin. But police looked at the 10-year-old boy and said, well, he's 10, he's older, so he his story is likely more believable. We have to run with what he is saying. And he is saying that it was a black male. So police were really operating under this notion that it could have only been a black person who did this, not a Hispanic man, who was seen at the other park mingling with children. Uh, also in a very similar car, if not the same car. This kind of thing can be detrimental uh, in terms of finding this person. But they were running with this description of it being a black man, and that's what they were putting in the news and the newspapers and all that. Police also believed that this man was a local person uh, who lived in Sunset because the grocery store that sold, you know, the scooped out ice cream, ice cream cones and all that, that wasn't really known to anyone other than people who lived in this small town. Uh, and he was very specific, this man, when talking to the kids at the park about it. So they believed it's someone who lived there. Rachel's parents kind of went with the idea of, you know, we think Rachel was kidnapped and put into some kind of like um, illegal adoption ring or possibly a child sex trafficking ring. Police would investigate this. They would look heavily into all of that in terms of possible motives and looking into, you know, known criminals who may have been involved in similar things, but they couldn't find any evidence, any physical proof, any circumstantial evidence, any witnesses to state anything along the lines of that she was put into some kind of 
abduction ring. The family, the entire community, the police, they all went full force into searching for little Rachel. They looked everywhere, high and low, all over the town, all of the surrounding areas, the wooded areas, anywhere that possibly a person might dispose of a body. But despite all of the searching, the community just could not find her. There was never any ransom calls that were made, and there was just no trace of her. And then, on September 19th, 1982, 24 days after three-year-old Rachel Runyon was kidnapped off the playground, the search would end. In Mountain Green, Utah, which was about 20 miles away from the Runyon home, in a very desolate, wooded area, and in a little creek, two locals had just been in the area, and they found the body of a very, very young girl uh, halfway submerged in the creek. And this was off of Trapper's Loop Road. The body, uh, not only was it submerged in halfway in water, but it also had like leaves and a log put on top as to almost to hide them. The young girl was partially nude. She had her hands and her feet tied behind her back and she was very badly decomposed. She was so badly decomposed that it was impossible to state what her cause of death was. They have never been able to determine how she died. Rachel was also only three years old, like I've said. She didn't have uh, dental records yet. You know, she, there wasn't much that they could look at from a scientific standpoint and identify her. So, unfortunately, her parents had to identify their daughter through the underwear that she was wearing and through the piercings in her ears and through a chip in her tooth. And that's how they were able to confirm that the body was, in fact, three-year-old Rachel Runyon. A couple hundred feet away from where the body was found, they would then find a pile of partially burnt clothing. Uh, and it was a dress that is the dress that the parents confirmed is that what Rachel was wearing the day she was taken. Sadly, there really wasn't any significant evidence left behind on her body or on the clothing, at least back in 1982, that they were able you know, to know to take or collect. There was just nothing. Um, and so nothing that they could link to a suspect. The family had no enemies. There was no people that, you know, the mom or dad had been fighting with. Uh, there was nothing. You know, there were thoughts that, well, you know, she was a beauty pageant, uh, a child beauty pageant queen. And maybe someone saw Rachel during all of this and decided to do something to her. Maybe this guy somehow found out where she lived by some chance. But what kind of takes away from that potential lead is that, like I said earlier, this man did not approach Rachel at the park first. He actually approached the 10-year-old boy first. What he said to the 10-year-old boy, by the way, I'm not sure. But clearly, the guy didn't get what he wanted out of that conversation. And what also the witnesses who saw the similar man at another park earlier that day said that he specifically approached little boys at the park. So what they think is that this man was really targeting, you know, boys, but he had to react in a hurry because you know, the situation. And so he just took Rachel and that's who he got. And then he, you know, ran off with her. And then the case just goes cold. I mean, they're really, they have nothing. They have, there's like no tips or leads that come in. It just immediately goes cold. And it stays cold for about two and a half years before police are given a new piece of potential evidence. A security guard at a laundromat there in Sunset, Utah, would go to police because in the bathroom of the laundromat, the security guard went in and saw a very disturbing and crude message sort of written on the wall. The message said, Beware, I'm still at large. 
I killed the little Runyon girl. Remember, beware. And then there was a drawing of an upside down cross with 666 uh, written around the cross. So now they think, well, maybe this is like a satanic cult who abducted her and needed her for some sick, twisted ritual. The 80s and the 90s were big into the satanic panic culture. Uh, it was a big deal then, and it was thought to be the motive of a lot of murders then. Investigators would kind of back up this theory of possible satanic cult you know, involvement, uh, because on two separate occasions, someone, and they have no idea who, left a bouquet of dead black roses on Rachel's grave. So they're like, this is all kind of lining up with this satanic thing. But they also had no evidence. They had no proof. They don't. This message written on the wall could have been just a sick person playing a really stupid joke. This message could have been written by a totally random person who had no involvement, or it could have been written by the killer. the The, the issue is, is no one knows. Maybe the killer did write it, but did the whole satanic thing as a way to throw police off. To this day, it's, it's not known. The case became more disturbing when police in 1989 got, I guess, some information from an anonymous informant or something along those lines, where this person came forward to say that they know that Rachel Runyon was kidnapped for the purpose of making a movie. A movie where the three-year-old girl on camera was tortured, sexually assaulted, and then brutally murdered. And then this recording, this tape, they made copies of it and they sold it to people. This is known as a snuff film. Sick, demented people who get off on this kind of thing. Um, it's... Uh, police kind of they had a gut feeling that this was a valid tip, that this was, it had some kind of validity to it. They put out uh, information to, you know, the media, like, listen, if anyone has seen this tape, if anyone has any evidence that this tape exists, if you've seen it and don't have the tape, anything, please come to us. They even said, if you've seen it or you have a copy of the tape, you can make a copy of the copy to give to us uh, anything. You can. We will keep your anonymity. You'll be anonymous this entire time. I mean, you're sick, but if you're not the one to have killed her, we don't. We won't put your name out there. We just need to know if this is the right path. But nothing ever came from it. No one ever called them. No one ever sent a copy of the tape. No one knows if the tape even exists or even if this was the actual crime that took place. And so after like a year or two of kind of investigating this path, it went cold again, ice cold. In 2007, the case uh, was reopened by a cold case team and they had evidence still, of course, that was saved, including the clothing that was found near her and the underwear she was wearing. Plus, you know, the, uh, the ropes that were used to tie her up. They swabbed all of it, tested all of it for any traces of DNA that wasn't hers. And this was in 2007, and to this day, nothing, this case is still unsolved. So it doesn't sound like anything ever came from it. Uh, if they found DNA profiles, it didn't match anyone because no one's been arrested for this. In 2012, police announced that they did have a person of interest, that this man that they have in mind, they confirmed lived in Sunset, Utah, the, that time frame, and was there in Sunset the day this happened. And now this person is an uh, inmate in a Pennsylvania prison. However, they have not really disclosed First of all, who it is. They haven't disclosed what led them to this man. 
but they've never pressed charges against him either. And this was about 10 years ago at the time of this video-ish. So maybe this guy, whoever, they, whoever he was, wasn't the guy. Around that same time, they said, well, we now have another suspect that we also confirmed was living in Sunset at that time. They said that this person now lives in New Mexico. This time, they haven't said his name, they've never released his name, but this time they said they do have evidence that would support this man's guilt, but it is not sufficient enough evidence to be able to get an arrest warrant issued. So it's not great evidence, basically. What that evidence is, I don't know. If they have physical evidence to show, you know, a, a male profile, for example, it's not known. Uh, a lot of times they keep that private, of course, for obvious reasons. But even still, with this person, they said they have evidence to link him, whoever this guy is, no arrests have been made. Um, the guy's never been charged. So, is it him? Could be. They have said that they believe that this person has people in their life who know that this man killed Rachel, but that the friends or the people who know are too afraid to come forward because possibly this guy has threatened to harm them or kill them if they do come forward. Just speculation on their behalf, but that's what they think. And then, as recently as 2022, um, a woman has come forward to state that she believes that her uncle is the person to have killed Rachel. This woman, who wants to be kept anonymous for obvious reasons, said that she and her family lived in Sunset, as a matter of fact, her and her brother were in the same class as Justin, you know, way back when, when they were all kids together, and that her uncle, who by the way, I don't think Justin had ever actually seen the uncle, so he wouldn't be able to say, oh yeah, you're my friend's uncle. But she said that she has solid reasons to believe that her uncle is the one to do this. The interesting thing here is that this is a Hispanic man. The other two men, by the way, that police say they believe could be a suspect. I don't know what their their race is. But why it's interesting about this woman saying it was her uncle and him being Hispanic is that Justin, the five-year-old boy, would describe the man who took his sister as being Hispanic and not black. And then the witnesses from the other park who said that this man was Hispanic and not black. But they only relied on the witness statement of the 10-year-old boy to say who it was. So this guy, being Hispanic, would line up with the whole situation. If you're only looking for just black men uh, during that time, you are you cost the entire investigation because now this guy has been able to just like run free because you're looking for the wrong person. Have police looked into this woman's uncle? I don't know 100%. I do know that they are aware of it. This was relatively recently still, so they may be investigating it as we speak. And who knows, there could be a breakthrough any day now, but I don't know for sure. All I know is as of right now, as of me filming this video on April 9th, 2023, no one has ever been arrested and no one has ever been charged with the murder of Rachel Runyon. But someone kidnapped that young girl off of a playground in front of her brothers and murdered her and then left her in a creek. There are eyewitnesses who saw this man as close as you and I on this camera right now. There are eyewitnesses who saw this man's car. Someone out there has to know who this man is and has to recognize that car. It has been 40 years. Rachel would be about 43 years old today, but her life was permanently halted at three years old. She trusted a stranger because she was three years old. An innocent, happy-go-lucky three-year-old child who just wanted 
ice cream and bubble gum. And a man took advantage of that three-year-old girl's innocence and ripped a massive and forever hole in the hearts of this family and of that community. We will never get to know what Rachel would have contributed to our society. We will only ever get to know the could have beens. We can only guess because one man decided to murder a three-year-old child for his own sick, demented reasons. He stole so much from the world. So much potential, so much life, so much joy, so many smiles. He took that. There is nothing more valuable and precious than that of the life of an innocent child. And because of one monster, three-year-old Rachel Runyon never got to live. Ever since this happened, Elaine Runyon um, has been a huge champion and advocate for spreading awareness about missing and exploited children, not just in Utah, but all over the country, you know, for helping uh, further child safety. She actually helped start the Rachel Alert in Utah, uh, which would later be adapted to become the Amber Alert uh, for the entire country. In 2016, the very park that Rachel was kidnapped from, which had since gotten a huge uh, facelift and you know all new equipment of course well it was named the rachel runyon memorial park uh they put this really big beautiful like stone with her story and her picture on it um and her name of course um and have dedicated all of it to her in 2017 the rachel runyon missing and exploited children's day passed through utah's legislation and that's basically for the purpose of creating a day to spread awareness about missing and exploited children. Someone somewhere out there has got to know the truth about what happened to Rachel Runyon and who did this to her and her family. And perhaps that someone is you. If you have any information about the murder of Rachel Runyon, you can report your information to the local authorities there in Sunset, Utah. You can always report the information anonymously and even the smallest, tiniest bit of information can help. You never know. So please contact them if you have any information and try to help get this family the answers they deserve. But that is it for today's case. True crime, a rooney dooney ding dong. I hope you found it interesting. As usual, if uh, you have tripped, fallen, stumbled your way into this video by sheer accident, you dumb, dumb, klutzy klutz, uh, stick around. Uh, we're full of klutzes here. It's fun. I tell four true crime stories a week here on YouTube. I also tell one on Instagram, one on Facebook, and a few throughout the week on TikTok. All of my socials are in my description below. They're in the link tree also in the description below. So feel free to follow me anywhere you like. Please subscribe here. Please like the video because that helps it get seen by the world, I guess. And nextly, uh, if you have a case you would like me to cover, please email me. That information is also below. My case list with all my names on it to cover is in my link tree. And scroll through the list, search it. There's a lot of names. There's like 4,500 plus names on there. I know, crazy. If you don't see the name, then just email me where it happened, when it happened, and their name. And then I can add it to my list eventually, I promise. Um, if you do see the name, uh, please don't email it to me. It's already there. I will cover it eventually. I pick my cases as randomly as I can. So it will get covered one day. I just don't know when. But it will happen. Next, if you would like to support me in any way, we do sell merch. We sell t-shirts and hoodies and a wine glass and stuff like that. We do ship internationally. Uh, all over the world is what that means. 
And so my good buddy Adam is amazing, and he is so good at this. He does it all himself. So yeah, you can do that. Uh, it's in the link tree and all that stuff. And if you have a Discord account and you want to join my Discord server, the link is also in the link tree. Please be over the age of 18 or you'll be kicked out of that joint so quick, bud. It's chill. It's quiet in there. It's not a busy one. Uh, there's, you know, you can actually have conversations with people where things don't just get lost the minute you hit enter. <laughs> so feel free to join if you like. But that is it for this video, True Crime Maroonies. So... As usual, as I close every video, I would like to tell you something very important. We're no strangers to love. You know the rules, and so do I. A full commitment's what I'm thinking of. You wouldn't get this from any other guy. Do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do. Never gonna give you up. Never gonna let you down. Never gonna run around and desert you. Never gonna make you cry. Never gonna say goodbye. Never gonna tell a lie and hurt you. Ha! You just got non-copyrighted Rickroll, bitches! Ha <laughs> ha! Sayonara, suckers! Uh, please don't leave.